Uh, yes, I'm Lacey Newkirk. Um, I work at Mr. Cooper. It's a mortgage company. Uh, I work on the servicing side, which means we take care of your mortgage, your payments, collect things. Um, I've been there two years now. I'm a technical policy writer, too. And I got this job by having a mix of uh, mortgage servicing experience, which is my first 10 years with just mortgage servicing operations and then also a little bit of the technical writing side uh, by writing policies and procedures as I learned the business. Um, I also have a background in writing from like high school and things. I kind of have a, a talent for uh, news writing. So um, I got this perfect job which combined both of those things together and was part of what along with Oren, uh, Mr. Bruton, whatever you call him. Uh, <laughs> we uh, created this knowledge management tool called Hoot. Um, and yes, the owl is our spokesperson. <laughs> uh, so basically, we're giving phone center agents um, kind of a Google for mortgage information. So they just type in a question and answer it real quick for people on the phone. Say, hey, what's an escrow shortage? Oh, hold on one second. And they pull it up, what we've written. Um, so basically, that's what Mr. Cooper does as a mortgage company. We're very diverse. We have a lot of um, diversity inclusion programs. We have a choir. We have all sorts of things. Um, so it's a great place to work. And my boss, Elisa Rios, she's the ADP of Operations Support, and that's the department I work under is for supporting the operations of the call center. Um, and what we do on a typical day is, of course, manage inbox, answer emails, but the main meat of it, obviously, is the writing. We have to go and talk to subject matter experts at every single department in the company to basically make sure we have all the information straight before we give it to the um, call center agents. Every single word in common and punctuation goes through legal and compliance, which can be a bit of a battle. Um, so you have to kind of make sure that everything's on the up and up and um, that you don't release any information that you shouldn't to the customers. Um, so we do that. We also do round tables. We do side by side with the agents to learn. Um, we have a lot of um, collaboration across different departments, and my favorite part is that we can influence the processes and procedures. If we're writing something with a SME about something and we realize it's connected to another department because they may not know because they're siloed and they don't communicate, we get to say, hey, did you know that they're already doing this? Maybe we can make it better by combining or, or sharing resources. That's my favorite part. Um, also, our biggest challenge right now, um, consistently, is getting people to realize the value of knowledge management. Um, seems kind of like a duh to me, but a lot of people don't know. They're used to tribal knowledge. They're used to asking their neighbor who may or may not remember it correctly. They're used to asking a manager who may not be on the up and up with what's new. So our job is to make sure they go to the central hub hoot, to get the information because it's all valid. It's all been checked. Everybody can give the same information. But that's a challenge with us is because as a culture, the call center is not used to having to do that. They're used to just saying, hey, neighbor, what's the answer? You know, And that may or may not be right. So that's the challenge is getting them to realize the value of this tool and getting them to use it constantly. Because um, that way, they'll never be wrong. And that way, we won't get any complaints and you know, lawsuits or whatever. So that's kind of the, the challenge on every day is getting people, including our own management, to realize the value of it. So. Basically, what are you? Any questions? Mortgage company? Maybe. They have questions. <laughs> Do what? They have questions. Oh, you're told to have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Anything about Hoot, how it's used? It's a pretty interesting portal, uh, like Google. Yes. Uh, so, um, for a user to use it, is it only through like call, or is it like an app? Or good question. It's web based. So within our intranet, so they can just type in Hoot in their browser, and it'll just pop up with a search screen. And there's also like the, it lists the most commonly used articles, the hot topics we decide are that are important for the day. So that's how they get to it. They can also get through to it through their call system, but it's easier to just go to the browser. I have another question. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what would happen if, like, for instance, like a user tries typing something in and they can't find it? Good question. Uh, we have a function called uh, suggestions. So um, if perhaps they don't find it um, 
or it's not in there even. Sometimes you can't find it and it's in there, you just don't know what to search for, right? Um, we have a function where you can make a suggestion and it comes straight to my team and we review it, go through all the steps to make sure that it's valid and then we can update the article accordingly because the only way this tool works and stays up to date is if the agents keep asking us for things and keep telling us what they need because I'm not on the phone, I don't know all the scenarios, right? Even if I mine all the subject matter experts in the back office, they still don't know what their customer is going to ask. You know, they can't imagine everything. So, and, and as far as they can't find it because it's, it's in there, they just can't find it. We have what's called metadata. So we have to physically update the keywords that we think agents are going to search for. Um, so we kind of have to read their minds a little bit. It's kind of tricky. Yeah. How many people and how long did it take to create the <laughs> Um Took four writers um, a lead to create it uh, about a year, nine months or so, to get all of the starting articles. We had about 600 articles to start, and then we got about 3,000 suggestions from the agents on everything else they wanted. Um, so that took um, about a year with only two to three people. It varied. Um, it, we got understaffed for a while there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so it did take a while to get through those 3,000 suggestions, of which over half of them were duplicate which is great. They just had yeah, to keep going through each and every single one of them. Um, yeah, it took a while. Yeah. So you're the writer in this, but I assume there's also people who are working to digitize it in a sense, maybe yeah. like HTML. And IT, like yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we have an IT resource um, that I coordinate with. Um, we go through Agile Sprints. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. But <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, we go through Agile Sprints and we I write the stories and I test it, QA it, and um, our IT resource you know releases it. And we're working on a pretty big release right now, actually, get um, to be able to go through the review process of the articles in the system rather than hey, SME, can you approve this via email? We want them to do it in the system so it gets tracked. And I haven't gone through yet. No, they're still working. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> it takes a while. We have a lot of big things in progress right now, actually, but um, but that's one of the biggest ones. We'll be able to do everything in the system so it's trackable. I know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so I know uh, for for whenever like a customer doesn't really know what they want, they just know what their problem is. Mm -hmm. How do you guys fix that? Uh, that's or a good question. Answer that. Yeah. So what that's part of the metadata is trying to figure out, you know, what's the problem. They don't know the question, but they know the problem is my payment went up. That's part of the method. Payment went up, and then reasons why your payment might have gone up. And then we have links in those articles that give you more detail. So that's kind of the way it's set up is kind of a knowledge-centered support methodology way, which is where we give them, we answer your one question in this article, but we give you links to more information if you need uh, to dive deeper. So it's kind of the way we structure the articles. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, earlier you said that um, you might send a prefer to tell it, but um, it's more like the wrong information. Um, is it okay to do that or is it okay to do that? And what kind of information? As in, is, has there been information on who that is incorrect? Mm -hmm. There has been outdated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in the beginning when we, other departments didn't know to tell us about their process changes, they didn't know who we were. Mm -hmm. um, that has happened, and, but the good thing we have um, set up with the QA department is that if the agent cites Hoop, if you can go, we have system where they can see their screen, mm -hmm. if they were using Hoop, they cannot get marked incorrect, because um, that's not their fault, right? So that's a safety net for the agents, um, but now, almost every department tells us when they're changing anything so that we can be up to date before the change is made. So that doesn't really happen anymore. Good question. Yes. How long do those changes take uh, like oh. accommodating? <laughs> it just depends on um, how loud somebody screams. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if it's a big deal, like, I don't know, recently, you know, to make sure that you check this when you're authenticating a call, that's huge. So we were able to rush it through, you know, within a week. Yeah, exactly. But if it's something, you know, like a really far off um, scenario that's not going to happen hardly ever, and it's just good to have, 
They'll just go through the standard process, which can take a few weeks. Okay. Do you guys have anyone who's like constantly looking for updates, or do you guys just wait for other companies to send them out to you? Both. Uh, okay. My team, uh, we are strategically placed in different meetings across the business. We just kind of listen in. And in case someone forgets to tell us something, that way we can get it right then. In fact, we had a call today, a root cause analysis about customer's experience. Listening to that, someone said, oh, hey, you know, I used Hoot for this, and I don't know if it said what you're saying it should say. So then one of our teammates popped up and said, hey, I'm on the call. What is it we need? Let's make sure we get this right. Um, so we, we hear it from different areas of business, but then we also try to go out and get it ourselves. What kind of challenges are there when it comes to communication within the company, mm -hmm. specifically with food? Um, good question. We also send out communications, my team does. Um, there, we call them Hoot Communications. It's basically an email that goes out to all the call center people that need to know it with kind of a headline of, hey, this is what you need to know, a few bullet points in there, because agents don't have time to read while they're on the phone. But they, the important part is that we link to the article that they need to reference. So that way they can click and go to the detail when they need it. We also put it as a hot topic on um, the Hoot site, so whenever they're on the call, they say, oh, that's important, let me click on that. But communication is still very much a challenge, um, especially when you're dealing with email. One of the IT enhancements that we've got working on is to incorporate the communications into the tool to be, make the, art, the agents force read it whenever if it's really important, like a, it's a regulation thing. So you log into Hoot and it'll pop up and say, hey, you have to read this and acknowledge it. That doesn't happen yet either. <laughs> that's on its way. Um, but yeah, so that's going to be huge because we can track who has seen it. And if you've seen it and then you got it wrong, well, why? You said you read it. You know, so that's going to be really big as far as compliance is concerned. But yeah, communication is uh, tricky. Lots of different departments. Yes? You said your job title was a technical writer too, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, can you explain like the difference between Technical Writer 2 and what Technical Writer 1 believe it would be called? Yeah, um, from my understanding, um, Technical Writer 1 would be like fresh, like you're green, you've never done this before, we're taking a chance, you know, on you, you don't have any experience, mm -hmm. maybe some education, I guess, but um, Technical Writer 2 would be you've done it before, um, maybe not for like 10 years, but you've done it, and, <laughs> and we trust that you're going to be able to pick it up and run with it not have a, a long time to learn, you know, because actually we were just kind of thrown into this and just saying, hey, go, do. So we kind of created it as we went. Because <laughs> there was no department mm -hmm. before we started here. There was no knowledge management team. So our boss kind of made it. So I know you have like your IT department and like other departments, but what other people, like what other titles of the people that you interact like day to day and like really often? Okay, so my IT resource is a developer, actually he's an architect, he does develop work. Um, we work with um, managers, ADPs, VPs, SVPs of the call center, so our call center operations. Um, we work with agents, of course. Um, also reporting analysts, uh, business analysts, um, and all different titles. Um, you know, some businesses kind of make up their own titles to, you know, give you different positions, but um, essentially, yeah, reporting, you know, data, we work with workforce management people who kind of coordinate how the agents are supposed to work and when they're supposed to work. Um, and then a lot of back office, like escrow specialists and research and things like that. You kind of went over it, but how did you get into tech writing? Could you tell us a little more detail about getting <laughs> started tech writing? Why did you Sorry. make that change, that career change? Um, I love writing. Um, I saw different policies and procedures that were wrong that I wanted to change. I apologize. I'm just getting over allergies, <coughs> and I kind of place myself in the opportunity to make those changes. And I noticed that I'm really <laughs> particular about writing and punctuation and grammar, love it. And so it just kind of was a natural affinity for me. So I got an opportunity to take a contract position for a technical writer. 
um, for six months to kind of hone those skills and make sure that's what I wanted to do. So I did that and I loved it. I was able to do video flows of like multiple departments, how they interact. It was like a spider web, it was a puzzle and I loved it. And then write the instructions for software manuals at the time. And to make it easy to read for the people, because that's the whole point is, you know, with technical writing, a lot of times, is make sure your audience can understand quickly um, and not have to think about it too much. Um, so that was really, it's kind of fun um, to, you know, what do you bold to make sure you get, grab their attention? What do you italicize, you know? Do, what bullets do you do? Um, so I'm just kind of a nerd with it, I guess. So I loved it, and then that six month experience plus the mortgage servicing experience got me where I am now, which is perfect. <laughs> So for people that don't feel too confident in writing, what would you recommend? Well, to me it is a big difference between creative writing and technical writing. I suck at creative writing. <laughs> technical writing can be like formulaic almost, you know. Um, there, there's rules, you know, that you follow. Um, so I would just say, you know, practice those you know, specific rules. Um, and it, like I said, it's, a, it's kind of a fun to play formula sometimes, especially you know, like software writing, you know, numbers, you know, bold the action word, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but you don't have to be great at writing either, because if you bring something else to the table, like process improvement, then, excuse me, we have editors, so, you know, you can be edited accordingly, but you can always do better at writing. What would you say is the impact of knowledge management that you've seen? Mm. Consistent, clear information. Um, we've seen complaints go down. We've seen transfer to our help lines go down. Um, people are more confident in what they do if they know that this is your backup, this is your source of information, your single source of truth. Um, and there's, there's just so much more to it that we've expanded on already. Um, I'm really interested in it because it's the possibilities are almost limitless, you know, what you can put in there. Because people are like, oh, well, that situation is too, too minute to put into who. Well, yeah, well, let me see. You know, if it's this loan and it's got this criteria, you know, this is what you need to do with it every time, you know. So it just, it helps people when they use it. <laughs> Okay, so um, are like customers allowed to like make a complaint on a certain article, and then if so, um, is there like any consequences for getting a complaint? Okay, so customers don't see the articles, so no. Um, they can complain about a policy that might be a moot. Um, we have a whole complaints department, you know, regarding mortgage servicing and all that good stuff. Um, in fact, who will be customer facing eventually? That's another one of our IT dreams <laughs> um, to make it customer friendly and they can access it themselves, so they don't have to call on agents. Um, but yeah, there's there's consequences for complaints, but nothing related to who specifically. So we don't own the information; we're just the administrators of the information. Yes. If you make it customer friendly, where do you see the call? We're going to need more people to maintain the chat services, chatbots. Oh. We're going to need people to, even more people probably, in my area, to maintain the information. Mm -hmm. So it, it all just kind of washes out. If you go that way, there may be more complaints because the customers don't know how to use the internet. You never know. You know, people will be balanced out in different departments. They move around. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm to to listen to our next Please do. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Morris. I'm with Kyoto Cooling. Um, usually when I say that, people are like, what? 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 You say that? Um, so we usually don't add the BV. I don't know why. It's on LinkedIn. But That's we usually just go by Kyoto yeah. Cooling. Um, I am new there. I only started in June. And so we are working on implementing something very similar to Hoot. Nice. So hopefully we'll get there eventually. Um, but I am basically the sole tech writer at this company. Um, it was very interesting when I went into the interview because they were asking me, 
how do you go about creating content? And I had an answer from the previous jobs that I've had, and they're like, okay, take all of that away because we have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, how do you start? And the way that I answered that impressed them in such a way that they saw that they could use me to help build an entire content management system instead of working on something that already exists. So um, for me, it was kind of like a, you have to have that flexibility, you have to have the ideas and the creativity, as well as the very logical, scientific part of technical writing to kind of merge them together and kind of make it work. Um, let's see, current job title, I am a technical writer. Um, there's no one, two, three, or four yet, uh, but there might be eventually. Where I came from, I was a two as well. So I think it's kind of a more like a standard one, two, how far up they go. Um, See, a little bit about the company I work for. So Kyoto Cooling is basically a company that manufactures these giant HF units for data centers. So like your cloud storage and stuff is actually physically stored somewhere and it has to be kept at a constant temperature. And so we have the giant units that do that. And we try to do it in a very economical way, um, environmentally friendly way. Um, in fact, the name Kyoto Cooling came from the Kyoto Accord, which was an environmental um, agreement that was signed to help with things like that. So, um, okay, any other questions? My boss's job title, this is interesting. So because we are a smaller company, my boss's job title is the Director of Learning Development. So we are working on a content management system and we're also working on a learning management system. And so I'm going to be both creating content and creating training for um, our future employees. What we are creating is very internal, so it is not customer facing yet. We do have hopes to do that eventually. Um, but right now what we're trying to work on is basically creating documentation for how to assemble these units and how to actually set them up once they get them to a site because they don't have that. And what they're doing currently is they're just having person A tell person B how to do it and just hope that person A is there when person B needs them. And that's, very, that's not very practical, so we're working on something that they can use as a resource. Um, and my boss, who is the Director of Learning Development, she was originally under our Chief Technology Officer. And this happened before I joined, so I didn't get a say in it. But she was originally under him in the Technology Department, and she realized that she wasn't going to jive with him, and so she asked to move to HR. So we're actually located within HR instead of within technology. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, so I get invited to a lot of the HR meetings, which truly does make sense because we do have a safety department. And so when you're out there on the assembly floor, you do have to make sure that what you're doing is actually compliant with OSHA. So I do need to check and make sure that no one's going to get hurt when we've got complaints. Um, a typical day at work right now consists of coming in, I get my coffee, we have free coffee, which is nice. And I will chat with my manager who sits right behind me to see what's in store for the day. Um, we will go ahead and check in with our Ohio office, which is where all of our assemblers are, those are our scenes. Check and see if they've been able to review the content that we've sent them, which is basically 90% of what we seem to do is we've sent them information and we're just kind of waiting for the scenes to get back. Um, so it's kind of a constant struggle because they're obviously very busy on the floor. You're not going to have very many people who are set up with a laptop out there on the assembly floor. So usually it's a lot of phone calls, it's a lot of IMs, um, they don't check their emails. So that's another part of being a technical provider. You do have to be flexible with however the SMEs choose to communicate. Um, and you totally have to be on <coughs> because they are going to keep doing what they're doing unless you bug them almost every day. <laughs> yes. So that's basically our, our, our current challenge is just making sure that our SMEs, who are very busy right now, some of units, can actually look at our content and provide feedback. Um, I think that's all the questions answered. I feel like I'm going to do that very quickly. Well, I am still very new, still at the job. So. Yes. Would you ever, would there be like any circumstance where for some reason, just because you are the new technical writer for the company, mm -hmm. and then your your boss, like you guys would have to go to site per se to make sure things yes. are in order if it's a big project or something? Yes. I'm glad you asked that. So first off, we have hired a contractor. 
is a very new addition up in Ohio at our assembly plant, and I have been there twice already. And it's you can only do so much on the phone or via IM. Sometimes when they are so busy, you do have to go up there. Mm -hmm. So it is nice they've paid for me to go up there and stay and monitor everything up there in Ohio a couple of times. And it's interesting because you get to see firsthand what you're documenting. You know, because mm -hmm. there's only so much you can see on the screen. And what's really interesting is some of the things that they were doing, there's only one person that's doing the checkout process. So when the unit is actually assembled, you have to make sure that everything still works on it before you actually wrap it and ship it. And so he's part of that process. And I was asking him face to face, how do you do such and such process? How do you test the pressure on this one hose? And he was like, well, let me show you. And he goes and he gets this little rubber hose. And he's like, you just stick this in here, you stick the other end in your mouth, and you blow on it. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's an OSHA violation. Um, <laughs> so you can't do that. We have to find a better way to do it. Um, and seeing that firsthand was actually helpful because I can say, you know, we need this product because of such and such. Mm -hmm. Another thing that they were doing is to test to see if a certain piece of equipment was on. They were just going over and placing their bare hand on it. Oh, it's hot. It's extremely hot. You can only touch it for a brief second or else you're going to get burned. But I was like, we have to have a better process for that. Maybe an infrared gun or something. So things like that you're going to catch mm -hmm. on site, whereas they might not think about telling you that yeah. it's just it's a regular really process. Yeah. Right. Um, and what's so great about content management is, um, I think you asked that question, what makes it so great for us is that Right now, everyone just kind of has their data stored on their little separate computers, and it's not centrally located. And so someone might have outdated data. We've got um, a bill of materials for all of our different units, and it changes by the day. If you don't have some centrally located source file for that, someone's going to have outdated information. And so if you can find a way to create a content management system, that's going to be your central hub. You can point everyone towards that so that everyone has the latest bit of information. So really, really important. Um, the version of Hoot that we're working on, excuse me, is uh, Kyoto Assist. And so that's what I've come up with. And hopefully, you said it took about like one to two years. And well, it was like nine months to get it off the road. Okay. Uh, yeah. Four writers. I was Four working up. on it, yeah. It took a while to convince my company that we needed a content management system or like an authoring tool because they were like, you know what, you can just do all of this in Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, it costs money. Yes, it costs money. And so you have to be able to make that case as well. Um, another thing as well is making sure that you know your software. The company that I was at before this was called Corpax. I don't know if you brought anyone in from them yet. Yeah. Um, but they, you, they rely very, very heavily on Madcap Flare a single source control. I'm not sure if anyone has used that here or not. But it's a great technical writing tool. It means that you can check out and check in files so that no one overwrites the other one's work. You can publish to previous versions. It just makes everything very centrally located. And I had to basically make this business case for our company to spend several thousand dollars on this software. So I had to know my stuff. And I had to make sure that I could show them that it was going to be a positive investment. So when I was at my previous company, that's where I was able to get my knowledge in Flare. I know they started working on it here. I heard that they do some programs. Yeah, upper level classes have yeah. used Flare, advanced technical writing, 4190. Right. Yeah. No, 4180, sorry. Okay. I think it's extremely important to know your software, what's up and coming, um, because at least at my previous company, we started hiring people mainly based on if they had knowledge of things like that. So if they didn't, there might have been a candidate who had more knowledge and were able to hire them instead of another person. So I do recommend checking out all the recent technical writing tools and making sure you're kind of up to date on them. Because it's a good thing to have on your resume. Any other questions? I have to actually. Okay. So like the map card query, you're saying that people can take your documents and edit them and have their own little branch of them? Yes, in a way. So you have, the way that Flare does it is you have a centrally located source file, yep. and then you'll download your local branch. You'll make edits to your local branch, you check those files back in, and it syncs. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and so, awesome. yeah, so everyone has the original. Um, what's also great is it has things like snippets, and it has um, variables, and so 
For instance, because this company is still relatively new as well, and it definitely has that startup feel to it, I was like, you know what, we might change. Maybe we do want to go buy Kyoto Cooling BV, but I don't want to go through and do like a find replace on like every document that we have. That's going to take forever. And so if you add that company name as a variable, you go in and change it one time, and it makes that change universally. So it's really nice. I didn't mean to come here and preach about Flare, but <laughs> it is great. Um, I felt at my previous job that I was more so stuck learning about the software rather than learning about the position. And so it kind of put me in a bit of a disadvantage. So knowing about it is half of that. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, did you uh, have to receive a safety certification to make sure everything was OSHA compliant? Our safety, um, our safety SME did. So I didn't, when we write our documentation and we send it off to our SMEs, she is one of our SMEs. And so she would have never connected with the one SME that was doing the like blowing through the tube mm -hmm. unless I raised it. So I can be that bridge. But no, I did not have to get certified. Okay. Is it just the experience that you learn like what to look out for? In terms of like OSHA or? Yeah. Kind of. I mean, it's basically common sense, and that's why we do send our version to our safety SME, because there are going to be things that we don't touch. I mean, she could come back and say, you know what, it's perfectly fine that they're touching their hand to that object. It's, you know, the burn is okay, I guess. Um, but I kind of doubt that. So in a way, it's just a little bit of common sense. Um, I know with several things, she's come back and said, you know what, you need to put something in here that says I need to wear safety glasses. And so we definitely do that. And every time I go and visit up there, I have to have my safety glasses and my steel toe boots and my hearing protection in. And we're climbing up in the unit. So you, like, it's not just sitting at a desk, which is cool. You get to actually get up and walk around and, like, get physical, actually, with the equipment and figure out exactly how they're doing it. In a way, you're kind of doing usability testing as well. Yes? Every company has that one person that walks into the building and everybody else, like, straightens up. Are you that person? No. I'm not. In fact, um, I never dress this nice. I am always very laid back and comfortable. Um, one of the perks about this job is you kind of get to just wear blue jeans. And you're not customer facing, so they don't really care what you wear. So nice. I, th I think most companies are going towards that trend. Um, but no, I'm not that person. Our CEO is, though. Um, but funny story, he actually. He, this was about a month ago, he came into the office and he was like, I need everyone to come to the meeting room right now. So we all kind of followed into the meeting room and we all kind of went and said, was about to happen. And he was like, okay, I want to show you this YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, okay. And um, he basically just wanted us to watch this video and there was someone on the video that reminded him of an employee and whoever guessed it got money. Okay. So it was, it was extremely interesting, and it's something that you can do at a very small company when you have about 30 people in our office. Oh, yeah. So there aren't a lot of people. It's got a very, very small startup feel to it. Kyoto Cooling actually started in the Netherlands, and so um, the founders are from the Netherlands. One of them is based in our office, and so we'll be walking around speaking in tongues, and um, it's really funny. But um, they do have a very laid-back attitude. And, um, but it's, it's definitely one of those you work hard, you play hard sort of things. And so when you have to work, you have to work. But when you get to play, you also get to have fun. For instance, every Friday at 3 p.m., everyone stops working and they go into the break room and they have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to have a beer, but you just kind of get to decompress. It's the end of the work week. Probably anything after 3 p.m. is not going to get done legitimately anyway. So may as well just go and have some fun, um, but do it responsibly. But no, I'm definitely very chill. I just wasn't sure what the dress code was going to be, so I wanted to err on the side of caution. Um, but no, this is the only skirt I have. Everything else is like jeans, <laughs> <laughs> sneakers, and I'm lucky if I brush my hair in the mornings. So. interesting because I asked that very same question when I was being interviewed because I was like I want to make sure that this is not something that's just going to like flounder um, and 
what they were saying is with a small company like this, you the goals are basically to become so successful that you might have a larger company buy you out. Um, so that is a possibility, um, which is another reason why it's so good to have something like Flair so that you can put the company name on the variable because it might change. Um, <coughs> but right now, the industry is growing so much. You have so many people using cloud storage. You have so many data centers being built and they have to be cooled in a very specific way. And people are looking for more environmentally friendly ways to do that. We have this giant wheel that spins. We don't use water. And so we try and kind of help. <coughs> and so that's a great push. We have a lot of people who are really wanting our units and our services. And what we're going towards right now is a very standardized unit that we can sell to a customer that we then also sell a maintenance plan. So we kind of have like a mission control station of sorts where we're monitoring all the units that are out there in the field. And if one goes bad, we can dispatch them and go and take care of it. Because if it goes bad, and the you know, say it's in like Phoenix where it gets like really hot, we don't want those data centers to get hot. They need immediate attention. So stuff like that. Yes. So do you have like a team? in every state or how does that work? Well, if, like, you know, let's say it breaks down to today, like how soon is your team there to fix it? What we're currently doing is we're hiring field techs that are based everywhere. Okay. And so they're just kind of like remotely working and kind of waiting for something to go wrong so that they yeah. can go out and fix it. Um, but they're also the people that we're writing for too because once mm -hmm. they go out there, they need to know what they are looking at so yeah. that they can fix it. Um, so, yeah, we've got people based all over the place, but those people don't necessarily have to be in the office. But our two main offices right now are Dallas and Ohio. Do I have a question? Um, so, you mentioned that you were waiting on reviews from your speed. So, would that be like that the company is working as like a following a waterfall? Oh, I'm not familiar with the wonderful movie. What is it? Oh. Because, um, <laughs> um <coughs> like, the way that you said it feels like you're moving in, like, different stages of it and not, like, hands-on working on it and, like, everything was updated by stages. So I'm just wondering how the process of developing that goes, like, for your life. In that sense, I feel like it's, at least in my own experience, I've worked since I graduated from here in 2014, I've worked at about four places and it's all been the same, sending content to SNEs and just waiting for them to get back to One of the things is, a company realizes that they need technical writers, but they don't realize how important a technical writer can be. And so sometimes you kind of have to prove your importance because they're like, eh, set them down, they can write documentation. So leave it be, and we'll do our thing. But they don't, they don't exactly realize that we can't just be isolated and create our own thing. We have to have their feedback and their input because we can only do so much on our own. And so it's always like, no matter where you go, it seems there's always like this disconnect between the writer and the SME, and you just kind of have to find a way to bridge that gap as best as possible, whether it is physically going to a location or whether it is walking a couple of rows down in the office to find your SME and just kind of say, hey, I sent you something last week, I didn't able to look at it. So it's just, I think that's the biggest struggle actually the time I hold, is making sure that a company knows how important you are and then making sure that they actually get back to you within a reasonable time. One of the things that we've done is, because um, that's kind of a question. Across the board, whenever you're interviewing for a typewriting job and you have a little bit of experience already, one of the questions that I've always been asked is, how do you communicate with your SMEs? And it really just depends. You, you work with what will work best in that situation, um, whether it's an IM or a phone call or like seeing them face to face. You, there, there has to be some method that works for that company where you basically are just pounding them for feedback. And one of the things that my manager actually told me this week, which is pretty telling, is if a company realizes that they need a technical writer, the time that they come to that realization, they probably need them 
about six months ago. Mm -hmm. And so you're already like six months behind. And I feel like that's kind of where we are right now. So there's this kind of scramble rush, as well as like with all these new data centers being built and all these new units that are needing to come on site, they're, all of our SMEs at the assembly plant are just kind of like stuck building as many as they can. So they're not gonna have a lot of time to get back to us and we really have to kind of work with what they give us. And there's also a time difference. So Ohio's an hour ahead. Um, and I don't like getting up in the morning. And um, so I'll usually come in around 10. So we have a flexible schedule, which is nice. Um, but if I do need to communicate with a SME, I might need to get in around 7 so that it's the start of their work day at about 8. Um, so it really just kind of depends. You've got to have that flexibility. So with the flexibility, do you work 40 hours a week or just 40 hours a week? Mm -hmm. Essentially, I mean, don't abuse it. But any time before 11 is OK, where I work. Um, at my previous job, it was kind of like any time before 10. Um, but you definitely need to do your eight hours. So if you come in at 11, be prepared to stay until about 7 if you keep lunch at your desk. Um, stuff like that. Is there a question at the back? Yes. Uh, besides uh, Mad Cap, are there, is there any other programs you would recommend like getting experience in? Hmm, that's a good question. I think InDesign and Dreamweaver, basically the Adobe Suite, are still used. Not at my current position, but it was definitely used at my previous position. I was a communications writer, and the communications were all done in Dreamweaver. So um, I needed to know the code. I needed to know, like, I, I needed to make sure that I wasn't afraid to, like, go into the code of basically any bit of software edit there if I needed to. I can't be afraid to go. Um, yeah, the Adobe Suite definitely, and as much as I hate it, like Word too. <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to have companies that still want this, maybe temporarily, and so you like reluctantly put it in Word for them. You still want it to look good. Like you, you want your Word document to look like it was not necessarily created in Word. So you want to kind of check it um, and probably, um, I'm trying to think. I think that's basically it. The Adobe Suite and um, the Madcap Suite as well. Madcap has several different things that they offer, mainly Flare, which is their offering. two bachelor's degrees from here in English literature and French, and then I have a master's in professional technical education that I also have here. Um, so my transition, is that going to be your next question? Mm -hmm. My transition was um, my senior year, I was still an English lit and French major, and I took an editing class because I had a knack for finding editing things. Um, and my professor at the time, Dr. Becker, is he still here? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll know Dr. Becker. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I think, his first semester here as well. And after one of the classes, he pulled me aside and he was like, have you thought about majoring in this because it could really open up some opportunities? Because I really didn't know what I was going to do with my degree. I love French. Um, but I also have a hearing aid, And so it's hard for me to like hear and listen. So I wanted to be a translator for the event. That was an exact one to work out. Um, and I had never really heard about it. And so I kind of became what he likes to affectionately call the accidental tourist, where you just kind of, oh, I'll look into this, and I love it. Um, and that's kind of what happened to me. And after I graduated, I decided to, I took some time off to like do a couple things, like get married and buy a house and stuff. <laughs> and then I was like, actually, I think if I really wanted some better career opportunities, I should think about doing a degree. In tech com. And so I came back here and did that and got in 2014. No regrets. Um, since you had like a, a different major than before, what courses or like things would you recommend us right now that we're like in the major to work on? Well, 
I should have take maybe like a coding class or maybe like a course or just stuff like that? I know they added some courses that both were amazing, like right after I graduated. I was so disappointed. Coding, I think, is vital. I think you should definitely take some coding classes if they're offered. Understand how to build websites if you can. I think Dr. Lamb uh, offered a class on that at some point. He might still, I'm not sure. But anything that has to do with coding and has to do with software knowledge, I think those two things are paramount. Because truly, a lot of a lot of what you're taught, you still get to use, but you do have to use it in a different way. For example, I think it was yesterday, my boss, for example, who still kind of works on some things, I'm the primary tech writer, but she's there as a backup, and she was working on a document, and she was like, man, the sentence just sounds really funky, and I don't know why, and I looked at it, have y'all taken style yet? It's no longer offered. <gasps> what, really? <laughs> well, I mean, it kind of plays into what I'm about to say because I was like, well, it sounds wrong because this one word is an optimization. And she was like, you know, so it's some baked things, into other courses. Though. Is it? Okay. So well, you don't have to have a focused to course. Okay. Good to know. So some of the knowledge you have to kind of use it a different way. Um, and so if someone's not necessarily interested in hearing about, well, it's an optimization, the action is in the mouth. <laughs> You can just be like, yes, that sounds funky. I can tell you about it if you want, but yes, let's stretch it. <laughs> um, so, stuff like that. But yeah, coding is essential, and software knowledge as well. Do the things. And that's just my experience as well. I think you're going to get different answers depending on who you talk to, but that's been my goal so far. There's a digital medias course that I think with mm -hmm. Dr. Lamb that is really, really good. That sounds like a really good course. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that big. Oh, <laughs> okay, and that's about it. We're out of time. Thank you.